Welcome to Cinema of the Rainbow, I'm Andy, thanks for joining me once again today. We're having a look at the 1985 British film, My Beautiful Laundrette. So, young Omar is looking for work and he gets the opportunity to renovate and run his uncle's old laundrette, which is a disaster, it's just gross and not functional. And to help him accomplish this goal, he enlists the help of his old school friend, well, I say friend, the kind of street bad boy named Johnny, and the two kind of quickly rekindle some old feelings of, um, let's just say feelings that might be a bit deeper than those of friendship. <laughs> now, first of all, of course, you've got Gordon Warnock playing Omar, and Omar's the type of character to whom you just form an instant presence and attachment. He is from a Pakistani background. His father was a well-respected political commentator and writer who's now fallen ill and turned to the bottle, but he's still adamant that his son should kind of make use of himself. And so he arranges for Omar to go work for his uncle Nasser, who's kind of this entrepreneur type, very flamboyant, who kind of accepts Omar into the, the family business, as it were, and allows him to run one of his assets, this dirty, grimy, broken down laundrette, which everyone agrees is just losing money at this point. It's a dead end. But this is where you get to see how truly active of a character Omar truly is. He is filled to the brim with ambition, with enthusiasm. He has big plans for his renovation of this fucking laundrette. And just, you get to see the places that his ambition takes him. He's willing to run drugs for this guy named Salim, who's also a cog in the machine of this family business. One thing that'll hit you really quickly about Omar as a character is he radiates this positive energy, this this boyish charm and, and just, as like I said, youthful enthusiasm about everything he does. His face, his smile, his, his eyes just emanates this energy that's just intoxicating. And then we're introduced to Johnny, played by the single greatest actor of all time, Daniel Day-Lewis. You can agree or disagree with that statement, that's totally fine, but for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna state that as if it's fact, so fight me. Daniel Day-Lewis, the greatest actor of all time, is starring as a gay role in a gay movie. I must pinch myself. But Johnny is part of the street gang. He's kind of your more masculine, bad boy type, someone you'd hire to rough someone up if they give you trouble. But this time around, he actually agrees to come work for Omar and help him restore the laundrette to some semblance of former glory. Now, the interesting thing about the duality of these two as they come together is that it's supposed to be Omar, who's the good boy, heading off to university, trying to do right by himself and his father and his family whilst Johnny is the untrustworthy gang member who's gonna fuck everything up, right? But as we see these paths merge and then diverge in opposite directions, Omar is really starting to do some shady shit with Salim to fund the renovations. And as he gets more like relative power and confidence, you see he gets this air of superiority about himself, which he enjoys a lot. And Johnny seemingly becomes more focused and humble, like he's trying to leave his bad boy days behind and kind of sees the laundrette as a stepping stone, an opportunity to head to the straight and narrow. At the same time, the seemingly old love starts to brew once again between the two as they work on this goal together. And I know this goal, of like renovating a laundromat is a weird metaphor. It's like, kind of like, okay, it's a bit too real world and mundane, but just the idea of these two facing the odds, like no one believes in this project, but these two alone are renovating this place together. They're working on this common goal and dream that's gonna better the life of both of them and they're doing it together. This movie is incredibly romantic. I know it has this feel that's like very kind of mundane and real world and realistic, but the mood of the film is incredibly romantic. It's very sensual, it's very intimate and very sexy. I'm not gonna spoil anything, but the champagne scene, that's all I'm gonna say. The chemistry between these two, the stares, the, 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 the tension, is to die for and it's enough to watch the film and watch the film again and re-watch the film once again for. But really, I don't want to brush over what I just said about the realism of the film. From its down-to-earth London setting to the writing, how every single character in the film feels like an ordinary person you'd pass on the street back then. The producers have said many times that it was pivotal absolutely pivotal for them to portray an authentic, real and raw world where subcultures meet and merge. That's why the gay storyline was essential. It wasn't just an afterthought, just that would be a cool twist or a different way to do it. It was essential. And they used the example of they didn't want to show your like your corner store Pakistani family, that, which was a popular way to, to present the culture back then of, of immigrants, right? They wanted an authentic and interesting 
Pakistani family dynamic that would then comment on the state of the country at the time. And in extension of that, you've also got a character like Tanya, who had some scenes uh, with themes of classism and feminism and, and other great stuff. She was a show stealer in this. She was so good, that actress. But that's just it. It is very much commenting on classism, on racism, on prejudice, on immigration and stuff like that. It is very much commenting on the poor state of the economy at the time of Thatcher's England and all that. It is, very, you'll definitely pick up on all that, that it is not only a film with a lot of heart, it's not only a very romantic and funny film, a very dramatic film, but it has a lot on its mind. And the film is obviously a product of early Channel 4 and the emergence of independent British filmmaking being taken seriously and actually having a shot at success. This is not the only queer film to come out of that period in British cinema, and you see a lot more like different voices and experiences being given light and emerging during this period in Channel 4 and all that, and just a lot more edge and queerness to these traditionally made-for-TV movies. Now, if I have any criticisms about the film, it's that the ending feels very abrupt to me. Even on rewatches, when the credits start rolling, I'm always so surprised, just because it feels like there is more to explore there. It just feels very, we're in the middle of something and then it just ends, you know? A bright side to that is that, I guess, the pacing must feel so, so natural that it just, rolls on really quickly, but also that I guess the way it ends makes it so that people can kind of take from it what they want. It's kind of a buffet of different things and, and subjects, right? So you can kind of take from it what you want. I just wish it wasn't that abrupt, that it's almost shocking to me that it's ended. You know what I mean? Now, another thing I really want to talk about real quick is the score for the film. The music is so special and weird and quirky in this film, mixed in with all these kind of sounds of water bubbling, like from the laundry and, st and stuff like that. And I tell you, my jaw dropped when I saw the credits roll. And part of the duo who made this score was Hans fucking Simmer. Hans Simmer. Apparently, what I'm told is that this was the first film he ever scored. I don't know, don't quote me on that, but that's what I heard. And that is insane to me. That's so fucking cool. <laughs> but that's my beautiful laundrette. A lot of y'all have been asking for this for a long time and finally it's here so y'all can get off my back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you haven't watched it already, please go treat yourself, okay? I'm Andy, and this has been Cinema of the Rainbow.